response does not immediately clear all the virus from the, from the body. We can show whether someone is maximally infectious by looking for virus antigen. So we actually have three main tests which are used in um, management and diagnosis of this infection. The one which the uh, Manchester laboratory that the University of Manchester is supporting at Alderley Edge uses is a PCR test. So if we pop to the next slide, one of the flavors at the moment is of course variants of the virus. These are expected in any viral infection. And this is showing the tracking of the variant which appeared in early um, December and then has risen to become almost 100% of all of the uh, viruses that we detect at Alderley Park. These variants can spread very, very quickly and therefore they present a risk. If we just pop on the next slide. This shows the spread of the variant from its first detection in the southwest of England. Already by the 6th of December, it was already widespread. And within a further seven days, you can see there are massive hotspots in Birmingham, in Manchester, Liverpool, and throughout the country. These variants can spread extremely quickly when the virus has a competitive advantage, as, as has this current strain in, in transmitting infection. Can have the next slide? Um, at the moment, the level of infection is decreasing. The worry is that we may release lockdown too early again. This charts the progression of the infection through October, and you can see it started to decline rapidly towards uh, the beginning of, of December when lockdown was released and it took off again immediately. We're now down at this level and the worry is that they may release lockdown too early and we may have a further peak of infection. With that peak of infection increases the risk of throwing up new variants and so surveillance for variants is uh, occurring at pace. We can show the next slide. The ones that we're tracking at the moment are these shown on the left and we have an operation in in place to try and track them down in, in the community. We have had Operation Eagle, which is saturation testing of areas within Greater Manchester. So we've looked in Moss side and also in Moston for appearance of the and spread of these variants within the community. The problem with identifying variants has been the time it takes to sequence the virus. It typically takes about two weeks after a positive result is identified for us to show a variant present. And so to speed up the process, we're now getting mutation specific PCRs to actually speed up identification of the variants. This, however, only identifies known variants. And of course, the unknown variants, the ones that might risk the eff efficacy of the vaccine are unknown. So genomic surveillance has also got to continue during this period while the virus is still replicating within the community. So back to me, and this slide shows some of the research that we've been involved in over, over the course of the last year. I know we've all been extremely busy in different ways. And um, at the beginning, Paul had, had a role in setting up the, the Lighthouse Laboratory um, up at Alderley Park. And then more recently, we've both been able to offer some help with understanding all the different tests for COVID and, and helping to develop the Greater Manchester testing strategy. It's been really important to get accurate and up-to-date information out into the scientific and medical communities because you know there's been some good stuff but there has been some real misinformation gone out um, to the general public and, and into to the scientific and medical communities and, and we feel we've been quite privileged to join up with a, a fantastic group of emergency physicians to deliver a series of podcasts um, via the St Emblems Network. Um, that was all real good fun and we organised a virtual meeting on COVID um, on behalf of the European Society for Clinical Virology that got really great attendance by thousands of people across the world. But as a virologist this year I feel I've worked with people I would never have dreamed of interacting with previously. Um, within the university we've talked to mathematical modellers about how to work out where viral particles might settle on surfaces in hospitals and elsewhere um, and how that could influence cleaning regimes for example. We've worked with material scientists who are trying to develop antiviral surfaces and coatings 
Um, we brought the specialist growing artificial organs to look at the effect of COVID on the kidney. Um, and that we've also had some plans of our own to try and develop simple population testing um, using dry blood spots. And then from the world of industry and pharma, um, we've given advice around lots of innovative ideas to produce antiviral solutions to the travel industry, for example, um, the aer aeroplane uh, aerospace industry. Um, we've worked with local business leaders to consider how producing um, uh, PPE with antiviral properties might um, both protect, you know, provide protection uh, for our healthcare workers via PPE and perhaps a better supply line uh, than the one that, that, that certainly we had at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and also, you know, have the knock on effect of helping to revive the Northwest textile industry. So it's all been quite exciting. It's been fascinating and we hope we've been able to have some positive impact. But there's been a limit to what we can do in a practical sense. Uh, and so hence the call to arms. Um, viruses such as SARS-CoV-2, because of their potential to cause serious illness and death, must be handled in high security safety laboratories. Um, and SARS-CoV-2 <coughs> has been designated to be at BS BSL level three. Um, you can see in the middle there the, the, the four safety levels. Um, there's a real shortage of BSL three labs in the United Kingdom. Um, and, our, and in the world, actually, um, and our university, in common with many other universities across the world, has not invested in these labs in recent times. Uh, and indeed, we did have some BSL3 labs that have since been decommissioned in, in, in the last few years. And setting them up again is very expensive, so it's, it's difficult to raise that capacity quickly. So whilst we've been able to work with um, some non-SARS coronaviruses at bi biological safety level two, we haven't been able to extend the work to, to look at the effects of any of these ideas and projects that we've been involved in um, on actual SARS-CoV-2, which is a shame because here in the Northwest, we are really well placed to be a region where the fight against COVID um, and unfortunately against likely future pandemics um, can be led. We've got many assets. Um, we've got three great universities with a range of multidisciplinary expertise. We've got the Medicines Catapult down at Audley Edge. Uh, and in fact, some BSL3 labs are being planned to be built there. We've got hospital trusts with strong virology and immunology capabilities who are making a fantastic contribution to the current response. Uh, and indeed the Oldham lab um, led by Joel Paul recently won a, a National Innovation Award. Um, we've also got the expertise and facilities to train the next generation of, of scientists, clinicians and healthcare workers who will be vital in our pandemic preparedness um, via our excellent undergraduate and postgraduate programmes in our universities. We've got a great opportunity here uh, and now is the time to take it up. OK, I'm going to finish there, hopefully within our almost within our 10 minutes. And I'm going to hand over to the next speaker, who's Marcello Morciano, who's going to talk about the effect on care homes. Thanks a lot, um, Paul and Pamela. So today I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to sum up some of the, the research that we are uh, doing within uh, um, uh, Manchester on the effect of care homes. Um, uh, so I'm um, pleased, I'd like to remind you that the view that I expressed here are mine and that does not necessarily those of the funders of the other institutions that I'm working with. So just let's start. So um, it's not new uh, to many of you that the impact of coronavirus on Keromu residents has been devastating. According to official estimates, about a quarter of all COVID deaths involved the Keromu residents with an observed mortality rate in Keromu that is more than four times higher than um, what observed in a non Keromu population. So why? Um, is that well? We know that care homes are fragile communities made of frail, mainly older people with complex health and care needs that lives in close proximity. And we know that close uh, COVID nineteen is spread by closer proximity, and close proximity cannot be avoided in a, such a context. While supporting frail people with everyday activity like showering, toileting, or feeding uh, them. So in, in my presentation, what I would like to do is to basically stress on three important um, points. So the first one is that COVID-19 is a crisis in a sector that were already in crisis. Um, and there, this has been uh, documented in multiple official reports. And I'm going to talk a little bit uh, later on on that. 
Second, um, we may see the sector that is made by similar providers, but in fact is a very fragmented and fragile sector with providers that differ significantly in terms of the service that they provide, but also in terms of the quality of the services that they provide, but also in terms of their organizational structure. And as a result, we may expect a significant difference in the way different providers are coping and with and then reacting to the pandemic. Third important point is that when focusing on Kerom 19 deaths alone, it might provide a distorted picture of what is happening in the, sex, in the sector. Excess death, which is the additional deaths observed in a given period compared to the number usually expected, better capture direct and indirect uh, mortality and um, impact. So the graph that I'm showing here basically uh, plots the trends on um, uh, deaths, weekly deaths. So the red line is basically is the number of observed deaths during the COVID-19 period. And uh, this can be compared against the um, uh, gray line here, which is what we expect from historical trends. So the vertical distance at each point um, between the two lines is an estimate of the excess death. So um, the important point that you can see from this graph is that we, we, ex, um, we, um, we had an excessive um, excess death mainly in wave one of the period. So we were uh, not prepared. We don't have, uh, didn't have any pandemic plan on place, lack of personal protective uh, equipment, and particularly testing. Um, uh, during that, and Paul mentioned, uh, you know, the importance of testing in that one. So we estimated uh, almost uh, about uh, thirty thousand excess deaths in for wave one. And uh, the important point here is that only sixty-five percent of the excess deaths were officially reported to directly attributable to COVID nineteen. The reason for that can be multiple, and you know, um, we had a paper uh, um, in, in in press to uh, from BMC Medicine that explains some of these facts. So first, so the first point to make is that wave one was uh, um, incredibly um, uh, um, um, harmful um, for uh, Keromo residents. Then we had a second phase, which is during the summer, where the excess deaths, uh, the number of deaths that we observed were lower than what um, we were predicted. And the reason for that can be multiple, you know, can be because of the enacted policies, so more testing and so on, but also better um, prevention and control um, protocol in place. But it's also maybe due to some changes in the population, uh, the Kerom and the residents population. So a selective survival, so most of the frail uh, components, uh, part subpopulation in, in the Keroms perhaps died earlier, but also lower occupancy uh, rates. And we know anecdotally at the moment that you know, uh, uh, many Keroms are suffering from lower occupancy rates at the moment. Then the, the third um, part here, which is basically the second way, where you can see, again, a peak in terms of number of deaths that you observed, mainly, you know, now, this time, you know, the, the, the peak is similar in terms of shape between the nursing, uh, care homes that provide nursing and residential services. Um, but again, you know, this peak is considerably lower than what we observed in wave one, and this may be because of better infection and prevention and control plan, massive testing, again, the lower occupancy. But what is important as well is this declining trends um, at the end of the period, which may be um, um, seen as the early sign of efficacy of the vaccination um, programs um, in reducing um, death. <clears throat> so, not all Keroms have suffered equally from COVID-19. Um, uh, uh, there are some that suffered massively and others that were relatively protected or managed well in keep, keeping the virus out. Why? So to understand this differentiated impact, we also need to understand a little bit the peculiarity of the sector. The English Kerom market is mostly private and very fragmented with the type of service provided, the client types, Cover the bed capacity that varies systematically and in some cases very dramatically by provider types and also by local authority in which they operate. So the geography matter as well in terms of the bed capacity and as well. Cuts in uh, social 
uh, care public expenditure led um, in the recent uh, years has led to more competition and then therefore more cost containment policies, which is you know, um, a quite important uh, point to take in account when you are thinking in, in, in terms of I IPC, so infection protocol control uh, measures, but also put some caromes in risk of insolvencies. And then there, there has been also a significant penetration of big brands chains and private equity firms in the market, which basically acquired um, small independent care homes. And in, this is in particular in some of the uh, English share, in particular in the North. To account for all these factors, we have used the regression analysis to explore difference in the care home probability of experience COVID death. What we found um, is that controlling for other characteristics, deaths were mainly concentrated in, larging, in large nursing homes that cares for uh, older people and people with dementia. And we know that this is a factor that Co complicates prevention and spread of the infections. Um, but also we found that homes affiliated to large provider, providers were particularly affected, in particular in wave one. This may be linked to their policies on staff and patient movements across facilities. Again, factors that we know compl complicate prevention and, and are likely to contribute to the spread of infection across homes, in particular in, in, in the absence of strict testing regime. So if interested in uh, this kind of analysis, there is a link to our paper that is, uh, is going to be impressed in BMC Medicine uh, shortly, but there is a meta uh, r uh, version available online. So to conclude, um, here at, you, uh, at the University of Manchester, we are involved in an extensive set of COVID analysis. Some of them are, um, will be covered uh, today. Arpana is also leading a multiple other projects, as well as other departments in modeling and making the forecast, as I mentioned in the previous um, slides. So in our department, thanks to NHR support, we are working on multiple projects. So with Public Health England, we are involved in monitoring the trends over time. Time and, and also to assess care on factors associated with COVID outbreaks, so the kind of analysis that I've shown you early. But we are also monitoring the effectiveness of the vaccination campaign. We have also <clears throat> planned to evaluate the impact on non-pharmaceutical intervention, including the recent oral policies that have re re recently um, relaxed. Um, then the important point from a uh, um, 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 health and uh, social care perspective is that the, the COVID crisis has highlighted the importance of having joint up health and social care services. That is a point that has been highlighted as well in the recent uh, white paper. So we are leading, I'm leading a project um, on mapping health and care um, integration policies in care home settings in England. And we are, a specific research question that we would like to ask is so assessing whether area with different level of integration have performed bet, you know, in different way during the COVID-19. Care homes are experiencing increased cost during, uh, you know, for example, for infection uh, protocol uh, policies, courting and so on, but also reduced revenues due to low occupancy rates. So therefore, this means that the financial availability of some providers and the sector as a whole is at risk, in particular in some more area. And we are monitoring the situation here for Greater Manchester. COVID-19 has been also a wake up on the or call for the need for reforms. And we are already seeing some changes in the way in which the local authority, the local authority procurement strategies in many cases, with a significant shift from a pure price containment policies uh, that many local authorities were using in a pre-COVID period. And we are also planning to study those. Then, to conclude, overall, there has been a huge improvement on quantitative data now available um, to researchers. This enables us to make some robust quantitative analysis to inform the decision making process. However, there is a real and urgent need to seek um, out and hear the voice of stakeholders and also the people living in care homes and their relatives. There is a big gap there, and this is you know, the, the call um, here that needs to be filled, but perhaps with mixed method um, approach. 
in a moment where the operationalization of public and public uh, of the patient involvement is complicated. So for instance, we are exploring uh, some artificial intelligence approach to retrieve data from online reviews to look at difference in values and perception of users and their relatives before and, and during uh, the, the, the pandemic. So I think I'm running out of time now. Um, thanks for your attention and please ask and get in touch if interested. And then um, hand over a way Wu that is gonna um, uh, discuss more on testing times. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Hui from the Center for Biostatistics. Today, very briefly, I'm going to discuss uh, post-test probabilities of COVID-19. Um, oh, so I can't. Okay. So the first factor which will affect post-test probability is cumulative incidence. By definition, it is for a given time period, the number of new COVID cases divided by population size at start of this time period is often called pre-test probability because prior to any formal testing, uh, this is the only way we can estimate for each of us the chance of getting COVID. And the two other two factors are sensitivity and specificity from COVID testing. Sensitivity is that given that I'm truly uh, COVID infected, what is chance of me getting a positive test result? On the other hand, specificity is that if I have not COVID, well, I haven't got COVID, what is chance of me getting a negative test? But in reality, we do not really know the ground truth. So that's why we have to rely on, rely on specific COVID testing in order to predict whether we have COVID or not. So that's why I'm going to introduce two important uh, concepts, positive and negative predictive values. So the first one positive predictive value is that once I've seen that my test outcome is positive, how likely that I, I, I do have COVID and a negative predict value is that if I do see a negative test outcome from, from COVID testing of myself, and what is chance of me in not having COVID? So these two quantities are so-called po post-test probabilities because we have to rely on the knowledge after we get the result from test. And now I'm going to um, show you how these two post-test probabilities will depend on the three factors introduced. So let's look at the negative predictive value first. From, you, you will see that there are three panels from left to right in, according to three different levels of sensitivity. And within each panel, there are four curves, uh, colored curves, according to four different levels of specificity. So if we were to compare the, um, uh, the, the between panels, we're talking about effect of sensitivity. So in this case, we can easily tell that indeed as sensitivity increases and then the negative predictive value will increase as well. And on the other hand, within each panel, if we're talking about the differences among those four curves, we don't see much difference. In that case, we can conclude that specificity does not play a key role in predicting the true negatives. And on the horizontal line, that's the cumulative incidence uh, value ranged from 0.1 up to 0.4. And we will see a decreasing trend here, which means that as cumulative incidence decreases and then the uh, negative predictive probability will increase. So in that case, we have to try to lower cumulative incidence to maximize the uh, uh, predictive uh, accuracy from a negative test. Oh. 
So for similarly for positive predictive value here, and we are, uh, it's on the contrary, we don't see a, a sensitivity effect on positive predictive value, as we can tell from the uh, between panel comparisons. But on the other hand, if we're talking about within each panel, we do see substantial differences among those four curves, which means that we do see an increasing uh, relationship between specificity, specificity of test and positive predictive value. And in terms of cumulative incidence here, and again, we see an increasing trend. So as cumulative incidence increases and then the uh, uh, predictive ability will increase from a positive test. To summarize, um, wrong prediction from a negative test is more harmful. I, I hope that you can agree with me because if I have a negative test, but in uh, actually I, I, I am a COVID positive case, that would be quite harmful because it's very likely that I will pass this on to other people. So in order to improve the level of true negatives, we have to lower the uh, cumulative incidence and improve the sensitivity of test. Thank you. So that's the end of my presentation. Now I'm going to pass on to uh, Hannah Ottison um, and Greg Williamson. Thanks, Wei. Um, but I'm Greg Williams, and uh, I'm giving a talk with Hannah Watson, and we're just going to give a global perspective, which is slightly misleading, as we're basically just going to talk about two international projects that we're working on in India and Nigeria. They were funded by the University of Manchester's Research England GCRF uh, QR funding, um, and they're with groups that we have already worked with in the past. And um, I'm just going to pass you over to Hannah, who will talk about the Indian bit, and then um, I'll talk about the next. OK, thank you. Um, so the first project we'll introduce is taking place in the sex worker community of Kolkata in India. Um, and we're going to be working with our partners, the DMSC, who are the Durbar Mahila Saman Wire Committee. Um, and they are a collaborative of sex workers, clinicians and researchers who take um, a community empowerment approach, initially to HIV prevention, but then moving on to much broader aspects as well. Um, so we had initially, we had some informal links with them already, and we'd planned to do a project looking at how we could build their research capacity. Um, that started in January 2020, and then quite soon afterwards, COVID-19 arrived. Um, Quite quickly, there was a severe impact across India. And when we made this um, application, the state of West Bengal was in a lockdown and the cases were increasing quite rapidly. Um, DMSC told us that actually the number of positive cases within the sex worker community were quite low. Um, but because of the lockdowns and the social distancing requirements, um, people weren't able to, to work and they found their incomes to be quite suddenly cut off. So we wanted to find a way that we could um, support the DMSC to use its strengths to help the community during the pandemic. Um, we had three main goals. So we wanted to explore the health and economic consequences. And we did this using a knowledge, attitudes and practices survey. We wanted to support them to adapt their services to mitigate the impact. And um, DMSC already had an idea that they'd be able to do this by um, engaging in production and distribution of face coverings. Um, and then finally, to continue our research relationship and building up that research capacity, we want to evaluate the programme together with them. Um, so just very quickly to run through some of the initial results that we got from the CAP survey. Um, our plan is to do this in more detail with the local research team, um, but we've just drawn out some initial descriptive um, findings to show that there has been a severe impact on income and that there are some barriers and challenges to preventing COVID-19. Um, and these tend to be things like access and affordability of masks and sanitizers, and whether or not people would be able to isolate, which is again linked to whether they can afford to do so. Um, so the next one. 
is just to demonstrate that um, the vast majority of people have not managed to maintain their income and they have concerns over whether they can afford medicine, food and rent. And then when we looked at what people's main concerns and worries were about coronavirus, you can see again that loss of income was, um, was something that people were very worried about. Um, while they've been doing the data collection, DMSC have also started work on the um, income support project. So they've remodeled some of their existing spaces and turned it into a production area. And they've sourced um, things like industrial sewing machines and the materials they need to produce face coverings. When we spoke to them just before Christmas, they were starting to train up um, batches of community workers and they were hoping to start um, engaging in bulk production by early 2021. So we've got a meeting set up with them for a couple of weeks time where we're hoping to provide, um, to get an update on how that's going. Um, and just finally to, to mention where we hope this will go. So we're going to co-produce the evaluation of the intervention. Um, and a couple of other things that have come up that both sides would like to look at in more detail, um, including whether or not the community empowerment approach really helped this particular community with their public health response and what we can learn for that, um, how we can provide more support moving forwards and how we could build on this project to improve skills training and employment opportunities in the future. Thanks. I'm just going to quickly run through what we're doing in Edo State now. Um, so just briefly, some background on Edo State in Nigeria. It's a southern state um, and there's a population of about five million people with a GDP per capita of approximately three and a half thousand dollars. As we're seeing with a lot of low middle income countries, the cases and the um, deaths are lower um, than we're finding over here. But um, Nigeria has a these are as of um, Monday, just over 150,000 cases and just over 1,800 deaths, with Edo State specifically 4,500 cases and 158 deaths. But as you can see, they are experiencing a second wave. Um, just to go into a bit of detail about Nigeria, um, so they were the, one of the first countries in sub-Saharan Africa to have a um, COVID case and lockdowns were imposed straight away. Their main impacts have been quite economic um, with oil being the main revenue for the government um, accounting for about 60% of it and obviously the prices have gone down significantly. They're suffering from declining remittance which is where expats send back the money to their family, uh, shrinking exports. Before the pandemic they already had four in ten people below the poverty line and that's increased since it they were, were the highest um, level of extreme poverty in the world but they've been overtaken by India since the pandemic and there's also a very uh, political side to it in Nigeria where the government um, provided palliative um, supplies for the vulnerable during the pandemic but it was found that a lot of the uh, government ministers were hoarding it which has led to looting and people have actually been killed as a result. Um, so our partner that we're working with on this project um, are Precious Gems Africa. They're a UK and Africa based charity and um, working in seven countries in Africa and they have their base in the UK in Bolton. They focus on health and wellbeing support, uh, particularly amongst women and girls. And we've had previous links to them in our department, but their base in um, Edo State is at Irua Specialist Teaching Hospital. So for the project, we started with an educational element and um, training up some community workers, which mostly came from the uh, training hospital or a local university. Our colleague, Anne Sahu, she uh, developed a um, web teaching resource um, as she's the communicable disease control lead for the Master of Public Health program. It, it included some generic COVID information, but also we tailored it to um, the specific situation in Nigeria. And um, so as you can see on the right, there's stuff like their national curfew was uh, mid at midnight to 4 a.m. Their limits were 50 persons um, in a gathering. They also had things like their two meter social distancing only actually applied if the other person was coughing or sneezing, uh, sneezing sorry. Um, so we trained 32 trainees with this and also they did a community training um, in there and it's we've evaluated that and it was very positively received. We're still receiving some data back. So these are some preliminary results and um, just some key descriptive figures that we've got. Um, the average household size, they 
and delivered, oh, sorry, this is the next part. They delivered the CAP survey to um, 14 different communities on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And um, so we've got a snapshot of these 14 rural communities and then the community workers would um, get, provide information about COVID and prevention strategies and stuff like that um, based on our training package. And what we found in this snapshot was that the average household size was 4.4, ranging from one to 25 people per household, with 6% having households of 10 or more people. 19.9% uh, felt they had no risk whatsoever of being infected. Although there was quite a lot who had worn a mask in the last week, there was also 73.6% who had been to a crowded place. Um, only 28.4% felt the household was doing anything to prevent COVID and 23.2% felt the community was, and a big barrier if they needed to self-isolate, 43.5% um, wouldn't have the uh, spare room to self-isolate, and 39.8% don't think other community members would. Um, we also looked at the confidence level. So as you can see at the bottom, the higher levels of confidence for dealing with COVID were the health organisations, but there's very low confidence in the likes of the public transport, the army, universities, and the police. Um, we also, but they are receptive in these communities to information with all of the options we asked if they wanted more information for over 70% um, requiring the information. These are very early results. So hopefully we'll be doing some more analysis of this data and evaluating um, the programme. And we also, the training materials that were pro provided online, we were hoping to reuse them for other countries because they were useful and, and we can just trade out the Nigeria section for a different country. And then we want to uh, look into the community specific results because the specialist training hospital do medical outreach in all of these communities. So we'll be able to um, help inform them of where they can help them further with um, COVID-19. And so I'm just going to now pass you over to Omar Ali, who's going to um, talk about post ICU and long COVID. Thanks. Um, so hello, my name is Omar Ali, um, and I'm presenting on uh, developing a post ICU service um, and uh, long COVID on behalf of our team. So Dr. Elizabeth Delgano, Dr. Heather Katz, and uh, Professor Aparna Verma. Um, so given that COVID-19 is a new pandemic caused by a new virus. Um, we thought we'd look at previous epidemics and pandemics uh, with similar, vi uh, similar viruses, such as the SARS pandemic uh, caused by this um, SARS-CoV-1 virus and the Middle East, Middle, Middle East and Respiratory Syndrome, and also uh, ARDS, which uh, uh, is uh, not uncommon in ICUs. We looked at documents um, um, and, and guidance for post-ICU patient pathways, uh, for those previous pandemics, uh, SARS, MERS, and we also, we also have the guidance, uh, a newer guidance from NICE, the European Respiratory Society, uh, the British Thoracic Society, and, uh, and others as well. We did lots of um, literature researches looking at tradi tra tra traditional medical databases and also preprint services, and we also looked at Google, Google Scholar, and we also listed all the references from those. And the idea for this is to give uh, local hospitals uh, information on best practice for patients discharged from ICU and also um, for patients who then develop long COVID. So this is what we came up with. Uh, it's very difficult to see, but essentially this is when patients are discharged from ICU onto the ward, what should be done at that point. Then 24 hours later, a couple of days later, a week later, um, a month later, a couple of months later, and then up to... Um, up to a year or so later. It covers everything from um, um, from patients' functional recovery, psychological, cognitive functions, their mental health, things which are specific for ethnic minorities, but also things for different disciplines. So what medics should look out for at um, specific points, the nurses, and also allied health professionals, such as uh, physiotherapists, uh, occupational therapists, and uh, speech and language therapists, and others, as well as primary care, such as GPs as well. And this just shows all the different stages and the different steps. So we've been working very closely with local hospitals. North Manchester General Hospital has taken this as their ICU discharge protocol. Um, we are also in talks with other hospitals as well. 
Uh, we also we, we've also started a national study um, speaking to patients who um, have been discharged from ICU and then developed long COVID, as well as, the, as, as, well as their relatives and also uh, hospital staff as well to learn more about their experiences. Uh, we're also working closely with local primary care networks, which are groups of GPs and, and also the, uh, the new emerging long COVID clinics to do further research. Um, so if you're interested in this, you can get in touch with us by emailing uh, Elizabeth Delgano. And the next speaker after me will be Kath and Anne, who, who are going to speak about innovations in teaching and training during the pandemic. Hi, welcome everyone. Kath and I are going to talk about a project we uh, undertook to uh, convey all, a lot of the science in very uh, clear terms to a specific audience. So uh, we're looking, we were looking specifically around innovations in teaching and learning or training uh, during the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. So I'm a lecturer in occupational hygiene and occupational health and Kath's a learning technologist in po population health. So some of the challenges, well, the background and some of the challenges because of the background uh, principally relate to um, the, the initial uh, brief of the, the project, which was to create a resource uh, principally for people involved in math, mass gathering events, uh, such as sports events. Um, and some of the factors that we were faced with were, were how we convey uh, transmission risks uh, in these settings, especially ab around risk and proximity to others. So it, within the uh, resource, we explored principal routes of infection, such as aerosol, uh, droplets and fomites, and we highlighted certain behaviours that can mitigate the risk, such as uh, physically distancing, uh, hand hygiene, uh, being in well-ventilated spaces and um, wearing face coverings. Um, we had to make the resource accessible to a broad range of people. And uh, we also had to be aware of some of the um, challenges around people's interpretation of information around COVID and some of the uh, doubts or um, skepticism around this. And so that, that made it quite interesting in terms of how we graphically represented uh, some of the messages that we wanted to get across. Um, probably the biggest challenge was that we had a very short time scale of uh, one week to do this, which then did govern the kind of resource that we produced. Um, we didn't use a video resource. We used uh, a particular platform, web platform that Kath's going to talk about uh, and we did this um, because we had to find something that could really meet meet the challenge of what we're trying to do in the time that we had and that challenge as you can see from some of the topics today are um, some of the fast moving knowledge environment and the uh, kind of how we can get this to as many people as possible so removing barriers to access. Yes so as Anne said um Originally, um, the brief was to create a video um, with all this information, um, but I'm sure if as anybody who's produced online material before, um, video is actually a very time intensive resource. Um, you need to prepare the script, prepare the images, then someone needs to record it in, a, in an environment um, that you're not going to get lots of noise, um, and then it needs to be edited. But um, as Anne said as well, the information on this particular topic is likely to change, um, I'd say from day to day, but probably from hour to hour. And um, video is also a very passive way of giving content to, um, to learners. And it's also hard to assess whether they understand that information that's been given to them in the, in the video. So what we did um, was actually build the resource in RISE 360, which is a web app um, it's, that lets you um, develop courses quickly, um, which is fully responsive. So it can be viewed on, on multiple platforms. Um, we decided to make the, the resource 
um, text and image based. So when this new information did become available, then it was easy to update, um, such as like the vaccine information. And then we also um, selected um, some high quality free to use images um, that we could also adapt for, the, um, for our resource. Um, and we used a service called flaticon.com. Um, another great thing about RISE 360 is that um, we could develop uh, the resource iteratively. So Anne could do something and send me a review link. I could add some comments and then we would just um, iteratively work on the content in that way, which is great within that one week time frame. Within RISE, you can also embed some interactivity, um, in this case, some knowledge checks. Uh, it can be easily packaged and shared. It can be a web resource, a PDF, or it can be embedded into a virtual learning environment. And then also, um, it's very easy to repurpose the content in RISE by duplicating the course and then tweaking it for a different audience. So this is um, a GIF of our course. I won't go through, through it all because uh, I know we're short on time, but this is just to give you an idea of what it looked like. These are the images that we used. Um, and these are some of the images that we adapted to um, put our message across. Um, and we also added in some um, knowledge checks. So as, as people were working through the resource, they could check whether they understood that information. I'll pass you back to Anne. Um, yeah, so essentially um, a, a great way to get something out quickly, uh, to have as much impact within a either defined audience of, of lots of different sort of um, levels of understanding. Um, that is an iterative process and certainly very agile in terms of maintaining currency. And also more importantly, it is we, we see it as being very helpful to count, help counter fatigue in re relation to COVID messaging. Thank you. And now we're gonna pass you over to the next speaker, Kay Poulton. Oh, sorry. I'm Kay Poulton and I'm the director of the Transplant Lab in Manchester Royal Infirmary where we do HLA typing for uh, people who need transplants. And this is a collaboration from the very beginning of the pandemic with my colleague, Brendan Clark, in the Leeds Lab there. So on April Fool's Day last year, I got a message from Brendan, quite agitated, saying that he'd noticed a very strange um, profile of HLA types in the people that um, were coming in with a, with severe COVID disease and being admitted. And he felt that um, in combination with this particular high interleukin-6 producer type that people were seeing and it was all over the press, we felt that maybe it was a particularly inflammatory combination. And he wanted me to pull my types of the people I knew with the types of the people that he knew so that we could do a quick analysis to see whether certain people were particularly susceptible to HLA uh, or susceptible to getting severe disease if they actually came down with um, COVID-19. So the bit of the immune response that we're looking at here is this in the red box at the bottom. It's, um, it's a huge and uh, hugely important bit but very very tiny in this diagram and what we're looking at here is where HLA class 1 molecules grab a bit of the viral peptide and wave it on the cell surface so that they can be recognized by CD8 positive T cells which will then cause cell killing uh, immediately and then there's a second process whereby uh, class 2 molecules HLA class 2 molecules can wave a bit of the peptide around to, and it will come to the attention of CD4 positive CD8 T cells and they will make antibodies which will then neutralize any further response and we felt that there was this perhaps a problem with this bit in some people. So why are HLA antigens important? Well that's because there's so many of them and everybody's slightly different in the way that they will respond to their infection. So we knew about 29,000 different HLA types exist at the beginning of this week. And the view from the top of one that will be seen by a T cell receptor can be seen here. If we look at this, it's called the antigen recognition domain. 
and you can see the red and the blue bits are where all these differences exist. And the green bit here is the bound peptide, the bit of viral antigen. And you'd get a different bit of viral antigen depending on which type you have here. Some of them are better than others at, at waving bits, at grabbing bits of antigen, and some really can't present any antigen at all. And they would have a real problem with dealing with the, with the disease. This bit at the bottom is just how we write HLA antigens down. And for this talk, you don't need that. It's just that we're a bit of uh, a geeky population of people who, who like HLA. But what you need to know for this is that you're just matching the numbers. It's a bit like bingo. So what you can see here by the 14th of April, two weeks on, we had um, a set of nine people from Leeds and 13 people from MRI who'd all come in. We knew their HLA types. And Brendan had been particularly worried about these Leeds people who were HLA A26 and this person who was an A25 because they all belong to the same HLA A10 uh, antigen family. And what he felt was this is quite a rare allele. You wouldn't really expect to see it normally. So to have it in half the number, more than half the number of people who've been admitted to date was quite alarming for him. So he asked if we had any, and of course it didn't, across the Pennines, that particular association. So we started looking at the population in general just to see what else we could see. And we noticed that nearly everybody was either DQ6 or they were DQ5 positive and they belonged to the same DQ1 superfamily of antigens. So we felt that we really needed to look at a few more types here, a few more people coming through. And in the end, we had 90 patients. We had to call it a day at some point because we felt that at this point, we really had something that was worth analysing. And we used two normal control populations. One of them was representative of the general UK population. And we got their HLA types from 10,000 deceased organ donors that we have to hand. We felt that this population was representative of just everybody who might get infected. And then the second population, because Leeds and Manchester might not be considered normal UK population, we, we decided that we'd match for perhaps the renal disease and for local HLA variation. And we took 308 people from our wait lists who were waiting for transplants. We knew their HLA types, but they hadn't been infected at the time of the um, analysis. We used Fisher's exact and we applied von Veroni correction as well for all the different HLA types that we'd looked at. And we found that three, P three HLA types carried particularly high risk compared to the normal population. The A26 that Brendan noticed at first was there and this re retained significance after correction in the UK population. It wasn't um, still significant with the wait list controls. And then the DQ6 that we noticed and the DR15 as well was also something that was coming up positive, this time with the wait list controls retaining significance and sometimes not being not retaining significance after correction. But what we did feel was important was that you need to know that DR15 and DQ6 are often inherited together in very tight linkage. So 41% of the population might be DQ6 positive. And if these people are going to have problems making antibody, because that would be the pathway that would be disrupted if this was not good, then, then that would be a significant number of the population. Um, similarly, if you're DR15, you're also likely to be DQ6 positive, and at least 30% of us are carrying that HLA allele. But there are some protective types, so this was the good news. And these three types, B44, CW5 and DR4, were all seen to be positive and they did retain significance when you looked against the UK population as a whole, so everybody who might get infected. And the other interesting thing is that these three types are all inherited together in very high linkage in a, a huge number of people. So 5% of the UK population will carry this popular haplotype and they won't have much problem in dealing with the disease immunologically. So in 
summary then, we identified some very clear HLA types that are associated either with good response or a poor response to infection. We um, published them if you want to read a little bit more about them, but we're also aware that you need many more people to be involved in this, this analysis. And so we're donating this data to an international workshop collaborative where we can look at this in greater detail. So thanks very much. I think that's all I need to say for now. Thank you so much to all the speakers. And um, there's just been so much that uh, we've been uh, discussing uh, that we have run slightly over. Uh, so I'm going to try to take some questions from the chat function. Um, I know some of the speakers have been answering them already. Uh, so speakers, are you okay um, getting your videos back on again? Um, Pam and Paul, ACE2 receptors, same in ethnic groups and children. Mm. And also, could you um, talk about the antiviral measures in terms of um, uh, spreading of mutations? Okay, I'll, I'll deal with the ACE2 receptors first, if you like. So that there are some differences in the level of ACE2 receptors between different ethnicities, but it's not as clear cut as following who the risk groups seem to be in, um, in having severe disease in COVID-19. So there's, there was some studies done quite a long time ago that suggested that there's higher levels of ACE2 in people of Southeast Asian um, origin, uh, but not in um, African origin, for example. So uh, there's, I think there's more work that needs to be done there. It's really interesting to hear about the HLA um, work that, that Kay's been doing as well. Um, in children, in fact, we had a, a student over the summer, uh, last summer, who did um, a systematic review for us looking at um, levels of ACE2 receptors in children. Now, there's not a great deal of information out there, but what she did find was that there are lower levels of ACE2 in the alveolar macrophages in the lungs of children. Uh, so there is an age related dependency. And again, that could be one of the multiple factors why, why things are uh, you know, less severe in children generally. And then the, the other question I think was about the role of disinfectants in, in um, perpetuating mutants, if you like. Uh, I, I don't think they would have any role because what disinfectants do is to kill the virus in an indiscriminate way. Things that are gonna select for particular variants are gonna kill some viral types and let others grow and, and perpetuate. So I don't think disinfectants would have any role in that. And, and I would say carry on using them as much as you possibly can. Thank you, Pam. And I know Paul's answered the PCR query on the chat. Marcello, um, are there differences in devolved nations with the data that you've um, been looking at? Yes, I think I will respond to that, 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 that question in the mail. So you may expect some difference because, you know, difference in the way in which social care support is uh, um, funded and um, available. Uh, however, available evidence does not show some significant difference when controlling for some risk factor at home level. So it looks like that the, some market characteristics and being rural or urban area, Akerom located in rural uh, urban area are the most um, relevant factor as well as with sites. So, but happy to, you know, provide some evidence if, you know, um, required. Thanks. Thank you. Wei, do predicted values vary by the test? So in specifically uh, PCR versus um, lateral flows? Yes, I think so, because it really depends on the sensitivity, as I said, uh, for a predict, predictive, predictive value from a negative test. I think um, different testing strategies will have different uh, sensitivities. So that's why uh, it will vary uh, from different tests to another. Thank you, Hui. Um, I, I've got one um, for Kath and Anne. Um, about the usage of some of these learning materials. Hi, what was the question, sorry? Uh, using some of the learning materials. Uh, for what? 
Yeah, was it, Raleigh, was it, sorry, I'm having trouble getting online, from Raleigh about using it for um, vaccine uptake, I think I've just responded. Oh, thank yeah, you. Oh, yeah, that we could uh, easily adapt it because of the, we do use knowledge tests, knowledge checks to help build people's knowledge and understanding and sort of myth bust and, you know, avoid false facts and news. So, yeah, it's a great resource for doing that, which um, I think is something we can look at. It's a good point. Thank you. Um, and um, I think there's been some more general questions. So how prepared were we for this pandemic? And um, how has it helped us make decisions um, as well as when do we see normal life resuming? Um, so um, I'm just going to quickly take those three. Um, I think the preparedness of the pandemic um, we had a number and range of different um, uh, organisations that were looking after the preparedness. Um, and I think one of the key things uh, that we can definitely do um, is learn from the last uh, 12 months uh, in terms of the response. And I hope what you've seen um, with our excellent presenters is how important it's been to come together and the rapidity um, of that response um, in Greater Manchester nationally and internationally has just been phenomenal. Um, and I think making decisions, um, including when we see normal life um, resuming, is going to be an ongoing um, uh, uh, issue that we're going to basically see over the next few um, months, uh, both in terms of uh, nationally and internationally. And it's definitely a case of um, we need to look at coronavirus as an international global health issue. Uh, but one of the things I'd um, like to end on is um, as well as thanking Jane, who organised the session and our fantastic speakers. Um, and you as the audience for some of the questions and apologies, we couldn't address all of the questions, um, is to note that the video will be available on YouTube. Um, we have our contact details and we'd love to hear from you. Um, I think the real key thing is how we've all come together um, to um, fight the coronavirus battle. And um, I hope that this means that we will be much more prepared for things to come. Uh, we've got our next mask seminar um, on the 31st, and we've also got an um, ARC mask seminar tomorrow that Marcello will put in the chat. So without further ado, I'd like to thank Jane especially and um, we will close the session and welcome you back on the 31st of March. Thank you so much.